Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of the Stone Club, the chairman of YouGov Stone, the woman I love, the one and only Carol Stone. It's taken me years to get to this stage, years, I can tell you. Anyway, how wonderful to see you all here this evening, members of the Stone Club, members of the YouGov Stone panel and their friends, and I'm really, really pleased you're here. We've got a terrific panel for you this evening. Before, oh, I must just say, because we're being filmed tonight, to just say if you could switch off your mobile phones, just in case there's an interference with the filming, that would be just so very, very helpful. But really, um, before we hand over to the main part of the evening, we're going to have the scene set from the polling point of view by the co-founder and chief executive of YouGov, Stephen Shakespeare. Hey. <laughs> Uh, just a very quick gallop through the most recent YouGov poll uh, for the Evening Standard uh, about the state of this race. Uh, and uh, oh, these, meant to, these were meant to be shown in sequence, but never mind. We start with Boris versus Ken, per first preference, 5% uh, ahead. Uh, the really striking thing, of course, is that if, when you look at how people vote uh, for, or how people say they will vote in, in the election for the uh, list for the, con uh, for the proportional representation part on the assembly, uh, Labour's way ahead. So Labour's strongly ahead in, in, in the assembly and yet behind on the mayoral race, which is the critical point of this election, that there is a big block of Labour votes that is not going to Ken. Uh, otherwise, it would be a very simple uh, 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 thing to call because lay this town is Labour, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and then uh, after reallocation of the votes, of course, it's the, that lead is, uh, becomes 53 to 47, which is six points. And this is just doing it again Look at the right-hand column has changed. Uh, this is when we ask about voting intention at a general election, and the difference is even larger. If people voted for Ken, those who will vote for Labour in a general election, we wouldn't even have to have a reallocation of votes. There's a 50% uh, Labour vote in London. So for me, this, is, this suggests that uh, while at the moment Boris is quite strongly ahead, there's a real vulnerability. Boris is sitting on a group of people uh, who are Labour voters, who will find it hard not to vote, vote for the Labour candidate, and who, after all, may be able to switch in a Labour should vote for Labour uh, campaign flourish at the end. Uh, in fact, we've seen that the votes have crossed over before. Uh, Ken started ahead in this series of polls that we've done this year, uh, then uh, has gone behind, and now it's narrowing again, with Brian Paddock gaining just a little bit in the last poll. If we look at the uh, differences in, uh, sorry, first of all, the, 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 the uh, issues that matter, uh, tackling crime is the number one issue at 44 percent, 39 percent uh, go for improving transport as a very important issue, and then the cost of living in London. Looking at the char characteristics of the two, uh, we see that the uh, uh, Boris is, uh, is overall seen, uh, the most important thing is how charismatic he is. 50% see him as charismatic, and he's actually seen as charismatic by a majority of Ken voters. He's seen as more charismatic, sorry, uh, by, by Ken voters than even, uh, than, uh, than they see their own candidate being charismatic. Uh, but on, uh, uh, sticks to uh, uh, what he believes in, he's much the same uh, as, uh, as Ken, as we see here. Uh, the, uh, the main uh, value, the main positive value that people attribute to uh, Ken Livingston is that he is in touch uh, with ordinary people, uh, and that is uh, uh, about 34% uh, of people think that. In fact, if you look at the comparisons, uh, we find that uh, uh, Ken wins on being in touch, uh, on sticking to what he believes in, uh, and on being good in a crisis. Boris wins on charisma and honesty, uh, and on the sort of leadership qualities of the strong, decisive, and natural leader, they're pretty much equal. Uh, when we looked at how people describe themselves, the essential Ken voter is someone who describes himself as ethical and principled, and the books they love, the, the books they love are Catch-22, Brave New World, 1984. <laughs> the essential, quintessential Boris voter describes himself or herself as arrogant uh, and uh, intolerant, and their favorite book is Winnie the Pooh. Thank you very much, Stefan. Over to the debate, introduced by Peter Cowder, the president of YouGov. I'm going to ask a quick opening question to each of our five panel members, and I'm going to give them and keep them to two minutes each. Uh, I then open it up, and I want questions. Uh, when I say questions, 
that does not mean a five-minute statement <laughs> about the state of paving stones in Hackney. Um, and I will be as um, tough with the audience as I shall be with the panel in the hope that that way we can get far more contributions and a far livelier debate. Um, but we have a great panel. We have, starting from this end, uh, Andrew Gilligan, the London editor of the uh, Daily and Sunday Telegraph, and McElvoy... McElvoy. McElvoy. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I did work with Anna to the Evening Standard. I still got it wrong then. He's now public policy editor at The Economist. Um, Fraser Nelson, uh, editor of The Spectator in the odd moments when he's not writing columns for practically everybody else. Um, Aaron Porter, who uh, was one of the most effective recent presidents of the National Union of Students. He now calls himself a, a blogger and higher education consultant. I hope you get a job soon. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, and my old friend, Mary Ann Seacart, uh, economist on, on The Independent. And the question I'm going to put to each of them in turn, starting with Andrew, is this. Given how few are the powers of the London mayor, does this election really matter? And if so, why? Andrew. Um, it, it matters a bit. Um, but um, one, of the, one, of, one of the problems, actually, that Ken has had, uh, both at this election and the last one, is, is his, 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 he's tried to paint the choice in too high a pitch. Last time he, last time he, he, he more or less said um, that uh, if Boris were elected mayor, then uh, uh, there would be a global warming catastrophe, that only he could save the planet from global warming. And I said, well, it, it really doesn't make very much difference to global warming whether the mayor of London is, is Kenny Livingston or Kenny Everett. Um, I mean, uh, and, and this time he's talking about uh, the need to save the poor and, and, and rebuild the NHS and, and rescue... And, and, and rescue the London economy. And it, the fact is that the candidates are, uh, the candidates are, are, are a lot closer together than they, than, than they claim. Whatever Ken says he'll do about fares, um, the economic facts of life are, 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 um, are, are the same for both candidates. Uh, he hasn't got very much money to play with. The old uh, Whitehall money tap has been turned off. He hasn't got any tax raising powers of his own. Um, so it's about style as much as anything else. And I think... Um, uh, it, it genuinely is a personality contest as much as a policy contest, and that is why Boris is winning, as we have seen on those on those figures you just heard. And admirable, uh, entire. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, Anne. Uh, well, I do think that uh, this contest matters because I think mayoralties matter, and I think that they are a good thing. And I'm very pleased that London blazed a trail with a mayoralty uh, when it did. And I think we have to also, in a sense, Ken Livingston you know, must take a, a bow for that wherever one comes out on his uh, candidacy this time. I think what this contest is showing up to me, I don't know if anyone else in, in the room has the feeling, or obviously all interested people because we're here talking about it, that it's, it's falling a bit short, frankly. It feels like it's a bit too much of a, at least one lady's nodding, <laughs> um, it feels too much of a rerun uh, to me. And I think there's a reason for that, which is that Ken Livingston is living in the past and Boris Johnson is living in the future. Boris is using it as his springboard to another address in number 10. And Ken, you can guess, and Ken, really, it is so much of a, 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 a rerun that, and also, frankly, I think it is just past the rave by date. But I do think that, uh, that what, is, what is going on here is something which is going to show up to us, and we should highlight it, all of us in our, our various roles, that the mayoralty needs to change. We will all have a summer of love and fun and uh, royal jollity and Olympic fun. But I, after that, things need to get more serious because whatever happens this time, we need to look at how the mayoralty is working for London. I would just suggest that in my day job, which is largely covering policy, the mayor, in terms of policy innovation, troubles me very little. Uh, you know, it, there's not much coming out of there when I compare what is going on anywhere else. And that seems an immense band. shame for a place uh, as vibrant and innovative as London. And just as the London mayoralty is rightly catching on in other areas of Britain, I think we need to look at why it is so limited and why we are in the same old fairly staid arguments about who's playing best with the buses, uh, who can make uh, the, the, the tube run on a probably uh, uneconomic model. And I just wonder really whether even within the spending constraints we could come back to, there is more that the mayoralty could do. Whoever wins is really going to have to raise their game. We need a reboot. Thank you. Um, 
It's true that the mayor doesn't have that many powers. Those powers that Boris has wielded, I think, has wielded them pretty well. I mean, we've got, um, uh, you know, he's head of the Metropolitan Police Authority. Crime is down by about 10%. Um, taxes are down. We've got the Boris bikes. Um, they're not a bad thing, albeit Ken's idea, but he gets a credit, which is important <laughs> in politics. And, yeah, and overall, as a Londoner, you've got to think, has, have things gone well or badly in the capital in the last four years? And when the crash came, I was really quite worried for London because this is a city which is hugely dependent on finance at a time where it's very popular to kick bankers. Even the Conservative government are kicking bankers. George Osborne can't give a budget speech without kicking bankers. But there was one guy who was prepared to stand up and defend the bankers, and that was Boris Johnson, even though he knew it was electorally unpopular. And, um, and that brings me to my point about why this matters. It's not really for what they can do, although they can, can do a lot of harm. This is about um, <laughs> this is about basically an ambassador job. I mean, the, the royal family they don't have much power anymore, but it matters greatly who the queen is. Now, not I am um, not comparing Boris to the queen, although uh, <laughs> we at the Spectator do observe a policy of sort of Shinto-esque ancestor worship. You know, so a benign form, but um, it, it matters uh, a lot because. As, as a Londoner, you, you, you've got to ask, who do you want to represent your city to the world? This is, as we did a Spectator cover last week of Planet London, showing how our wonderful city um, has not gotten that much in common with the rest of Britain. Um, but w when the riots came, that's when you realise that you are, you do feel identity to this. And we've got, we've got Pauline Pierce, the, her uh, the Hackman of Hero of, um, heroine of Hackney, here tonight. Um, and... It's those moments when she stood up and told those writers what for that make you realise that this is, you feel a loyalty to the city almost like you do to a country. Who do you want to represent it? Who do you want to be the face of our wonderful city? Do you want it to be the reptilian Ken or Bojo? There is no contest. <laughs> Aaron will give a slightly different view. Yeah, us, absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. I, I think that the mayoral contest matters for three key reasons. The first is actually what it says about the state of the political parties. This is actually the, the biggest, the last big milestone between now and the next general election. And perhaps it doesn't matter what uh, Boris or Ken might do in terms of the influence they might wield uh, in terms of London, but I think it does matter in terms of it might turn around David Cameron's slightly failing recent fortunes, or it might perhaps start to hammer in a coffin, uh, the, the final nail into Ed Miliband's coffin if Ken Livingston uh, does fail and fails badly, and that is then associated with the Labour Party. Although I'm quite a fan of the more recent conspiracy theory, uh, which is that perhaps Labour doesn't want Ken Livingston to be the second most prominent Labour person in the run-up to the next uh, uh, general election. But the reason that I stand by what I'm saying, uh, I think there is a big impact uh, in terms of uh, the impact politically for the parties and whether this might actually be an opportunity for Labour to secure some success in London and it might start to uh, ensure that the Labour Party are looking like a party that might be ready to return to government. My other two reasons are a little bit more uh, selfish uh, and they're more personal to me. The first is the impact that the mayor can have still on the money in the pocket of the individual. Because others might say that the mayor doesn't have much influence. But if Boris Johnson, uh, but if Ken Livingstone over the course of the next uh, uh, mayoral cycle is able to genuinely shave a thousand pounds of how much it costs for me in zone three to get into central London each day, and as Peter kindly pointed out, for someone that perhaps doesn't earn uh, as much money as my distinguished uh, uh, panellists... And it also points out you've got 30 seconds to get... That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then actually that does have a big impact. And Ken's promises to look at the education maintenance allowance, support for the poorest students in college, I also think is something that's worthy of recognition, even if Boris is, is playing that on the other side with saying that he might look at council tax. But actually the money that it might save, I think, is more spin than perhaps substance. And the final, very shortly, is the impact that the mayor can have uh, on being an ambassador, but also tackling crime uh, directly. I have to say, I thought Boris's uh, response over the summer was something uh, quite lacklustre and rather arrogant, and it doesn't surprise me that people do describe Boris in okay. that way. I would feel a lot prouder if Ken was standing up for London uh, in, 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 the, in the face of what we did suffer during last uh, su summer's riots. Thank you. I'm going to bring, bring Pauline in just a minute, um, <laughs> because... You know, I think a lot of us want to hear what, what she has to say. She's already been referred to, but Mary Ann first. Well, 
The powers of the London mayor are not inconsiderable. He does actually get to wave the flag at the Olympic ceremony in a very ungainly way, and who wouldn't want to do that? Um, he's, he's also in charge, as the other panellists have said, of transport and, to some extent, crime, and those are two of the most important things um, to anyone living in London. Um, and I think we also have a feeling that if the London mayor is successful in his job, he's likely over time to gain more powers. I mean, the, the ratchet seems to be working in that way, whether it's in Scotland or in, uh, amongst city mayors. And of course, as the others have said, he's a figurehead and he's a lobbyist for London. And London, you know, as, a, as the huge capital city, needs an important voice, both in government and abroad, which is why, of course, charisma matters, which is why people are going to vote for Boris rather than Ken, even if they're instinctively Labour voters. Um, it's why Boris and Ken are the only two politicians we all call by their Christian names. I mean, that in itself is quite significant, isn't it? Um, but it's also, I think, why a fresh Labour candidate would have been better. I think if we'd had someone like Una King, it would have been a much more interesting contest uh, than with the old, um, um, what did you say about raving? Anyway, past his rave by date, um, Ken, Ken Livingston. Um, I also think it's important, I mean, it's really good for us Londoners to have a political say, and not just to be voting for our local council once every four years, but to have another chance to vote in between elections. So, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I would vote every single week, given a chance, and I find it incredibly frustrating that we have so little chance to vote. So hooray that we all get a chance to vote um, in two weeks' time on Thursday. Uh, all right. Um, it's important for us political journalists because we can get to read the tea leaves and we can say things like, oh, does this put Boris in a stronger position to get back into the House of Commons in 2015 and then challenge George Osborne for the leadership after the next election? Or if he is mayor, does that mean he won't be able to be an MP again? All this is quite fun. It will also be damaging for Miliband if Livingston loses. And the saddest thing, finally, I think is the difficulty that the independent candidate, Siobhan Benita, has had in getting herself heard. Because there is a real craving for authenticity and independence, which is why both Boris and Ken try to distance themselves from their parties. I'm going to vote for her first and put one of the other three as a second preference, just to make that point. I do agree, Anne, that, that she's not had the kind of um, exposure that, that uh, if it, one would like in a contest like this. However, perhaps some Pauline, Pauline Pierce. The um, heroine of Hackney. Uh, now, you presumably have not stood yourself in there because you're impressed by the. <laughs> Seriously, you know, elections should be times when people and democracy addresses big issues. Few issues have been bigger than the one you stepped into. How do you feel the current election? I I is it living up? So the hopes you would have of London deciding its own future? Um, personally, I. It might sound biased, but there, there is. Uh, we haven't mentioned Brian at all, and uh, being a Liberal Dem now, <laughs> who would have thought I would have got involved in politics? But yes, being a Lib Dem, um, I see a lot more realness as we would say, um, coming from Brian. He, he is so real to the point that he gets on buses, he gets on trains, he, he does everything like an everyday person. And he's visited us in Hackney many occasions and proven himself to, to care. And to me, all the flamboyance of Boris and the shakiness of Ken, um, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's a bit distressing because I'm, I'm a bit concerned that it is all showmanship, and it is all to get the votes, but it's not real. And Brian is quietly in the background fighting for what's real, the stop and search, which has been proven to be a racist issue, the, 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 the lack of social housing, which are real issues in my borough, and also the, 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 um, the, the misuse of community centers, because there are many, but they're never open. So therefore, the children are always on the streets when they've got nowhere to go, they're hanging on the corner, and then the police will stop them for no reason, arrest them, take them off, and it's a long story. Criminogenic history, life circles go around, it's repetitive, go to jail, come out, no jobs to look forward to. I haven't heard any of them addressing these issues, and that's what concerns me. Thank you very much indeed.